Elizabeth Gray and Alan Ardansky um, as the 22nd Lewis Icon visiting assistant professor. I follow Dan Wood, who occupied the chair last spring, spring of 2014. Typically, the con visiting assistant professorship brings young architect educators to our school, offering the opportunity to lead an advanced studio and, if they wish, a seminar. But with Gray or Gansky, the situation is somewhat different. They are young, that's true. <laughs> but they are friends and familiar to many of us. Alan Organsky is already a member of our faculty. Um, and coordinating the spring term of the first year. Okay. Yep. Um, Lisa yep. Gray has not for a long time taught in the school, um, so this is a pairing of, of Shall we say, and a familiar talent uh, who holds special promise for us all over this semester. Elizabeth Gray holds a Bachelor of Arts in both English and Architecture, as well as the Master of Architecture from Yale. In 1994, she entered independent practice and was joined two years later by Alan Organsky, who holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from Brown University and a Master of Architecture from Yale, where he was awarded the William Burke Winchester Fellowship, Traveling Fellowship, our school's highest honor. Lisa Gray has combined practice with occasional teaching of history and theory at Yale and joined by Alan Organsky, Advanced Design at Roger Williams University. The work of the Gray Organsky Partnership is notable for its inspired craftsmanship, environmental sensitivity, and elegant sense of composition. While much of that work has been realized in Connecticut, the partnership has recently begun to attract clients from a wider field. In a Little League grandstand, for example, on Staten Island, New York, received a New York Public Design Commission Award. In 2005, they were selected by the Architectural League for its Emerging Architects Award. In 2012, the American Academy of Arts and Letters uh, honored Ms. Gray and Mr. Organsky with an Arts and Letters Award in Architecture. Please join me in welcoming the fall of 2014 Lewis Icon Visiting Assistant Professors as they deliver the lecture, scares me all the music. Thank you.
So mysterious utterances like this were all around us at the time of Mary Gale. And I, I think it means something. I'm not sure really what it means. But if, it's, if, if it means anything, it means do what you think is right. Um, keep at it, even when it's hard, and even when people disagree. Uh, being at Yale with Khan as your teacher, which unfortunately we didn't experience, wasn't a quite an experience. Uh, very long on the oracular, perhaps, maybe a little short on operating instructions. Um, you know, it, it makes us wonder when we think about Khan, I think it's appropriate that we do briefly, uh, though we're no experts in Khan, right? There's certain experts in the field uh, here tonight. We wonder what Khan's life project could ever tell us that short, in a way, life uh, project. A man who spoke in mystical aphorisms, but built buildings of enormous power, physical power, as well as spiritual power. He didn't choose to speak of money lost, of tears shed, sweat exuded, blood let. He spoke how to, about how to make buildings of it, but elliptically. Um, elliptically of the means and measures he applied to his monument. Khan was, of course, experimenting with any available means to ex execute his own magnificent vision for a nation's capital. It speaks of a different time and perhaps uh, different cultural motives. Uh, but it doesn't admit constraint and difficulty. So this evening, we propose something of an analysis, an exchange. Uh, taking as our theme, Lionel Robbins, the former head of the London School of Economics, um, Lionel Robbins' definition of economics. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I should say that uh, we're, we're not economists. Uh, really what we are um, are people exploring not money or finance, but architectural demands, practical constraints, perhaps verging on austerity and material means as our currency. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I should say that Lisa and I have never, after 25 years of practice, lectured together. So this is a little bit of an exchange, an economic exchange of approach, uh, content, and time. Test run. Test run, knock them dead. <laughs> um, so Alan and I, uh, even when we were here, I think both knew that building would be the place where we felt that our ideas would best play out. Maybe that's part of the DNA here at Yale, uh, maybe especially at that time. Um, we do think that building is the medium through which architectural ideas are most forcefully uh, and unforgivingly expressed. So we knew that we wanted to work material to manipulate, to gain facility with what we feel is our architecture's special tool. And we explore material processes and impacts like texture, surface, form, space, light, scale, contrast, environmental analysis, fabrication and production, and site, among many others. Uh, so these really became the, the basis of our, of our focus together uh, when we launched our practice. Um, and today, we are officially two, but actually many, many practices um, uh, at our place down on Crown Street. Uh, Gray Organsky Architecture and Jig Design Build, where we take on uh, really omnivorously architectural design, construction <coughs> management, fabrication, interior design, wood and metal working, uh, site design, quantitative environmental analysis. Um, and we really merge all of that into a kind of tangle of processes that involve reflection and documentation, representation, testing, assessment, execution, really what we collectively call design. Um, so I would characterize our approach actually as one of extreme earnestness and maybe even a delusional sense of taking on every design and building challenge. Um, we look for all building types. Um, we love different locations and sites. We embrace many different kinds of client groups, even teaching assignments. Um, and we're occasionally reckless maybe in our material experimentation. But we are dogged in our belief that a life in architecture, and we hope also in practice, is the orchestration of large themes executed at a small and <coughs> particular scale, maybe rather than one of hyper-specialization. So just a few words about our approach and a few projects um, and some uses. 
uh, along with some provisional conclusions. So here's a, an early project uh, up in northwest Connecticut. It's true, much of our work has been in Connecticut, as Bob said. Um, and it, this was really uh, the insertion of a very tiny building into a protected watershed, which is now a pristine landscape. Um, it's a landscape that generates energy, clean energy for the building, um, where the building really just simply tries to fit in uh, to create a quiet place. Uh, and at this time in our work, um, we really had a passion for exploring uh, the expression of construction as a source of, of scale and detail. Um, and of course, the manipulation of daylight, um, which is a, a, a theme, I think, throughout our work. Um, and here, an early test of um, material fabrication, um, uh, such as the sort of CNC cut slide that you see there. Um, and we had also, I think, an interest in blurring the distinctions between inside and outside, um, and a predilection to uh, draw and design every detail, no matter how small, and to plan its manufacture, uh, care about how it would wear and how it would perform. But ultimately, this project became an interest in helping buildings to limit the intensity of their construction. Um, we saw firsthand uh, the work that was involved in making this tiny building and then in covering up the scars of its, of its uh, construction. So we gained really, an, I think, an interest in assembly and prefabrication of elements um, as a means of limiting disrup dis disruption and, of course, also controlling and increasing quality. Um, because uh, uh, this beautiful landscape, this, the source of the ground source heat pump, and and a, a wet, beautiful wetland habitat uh, in a protected watershed um, actually had to be remediated. So this is what it was like when we got there. Um, and uh, so through this, we ha had to confront ideas about disruption and about managing resources and about the impacts of uh, undertaking architectural and building action. Um, and we just sort of charted there. There's the, the town in Connecticut. Um, the, 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 network of roads that were served by this quarry that was in operation for decades before our client acquired this property and charged us with um, restoring the pond there. Um, so, so this was a lesson for us um, that this perfectly crafted little pavilion um, was really part of a much larger, larger legacy of building impacts. Um, so we were trying to be an environmental exemplar uh, in the performance and construction of that building, but we realized that we needed to pull the frame out and understand um, that the boundaries of the project were far greater than we had um, originally understood. Uh, here's David Plowden's beautiful photograph of taconite pellets at Bethlehem Steel, um, ironic and kind of horrifying, but also very beautiful. And John Whiteman, um, architect, architecture speaks with a corpse in its mouth. Um, uh, I think John was, was talking at the time about the burden of history, really the history of uh, dead white men, not about environmental uh, devastation, but the phrase we think works very well to try to um, get at the impact, the range of impacts that we're interested in understanding. Another early project um, that taught us about project limits um, and instructed us on what constitutes the work of a project. So this was a pristine nature conservancy. Um, a bridge was wanted, but really no one could step into the landscape. So an organizing feature of the project became limiting its impact. Uh, so we, our d design was a sort of narrow ribbon that we threaded across the ravine, pinning down onto ledge, um, introducing no concrete, of course, um, and <coughs> trying to have as light a touch as possible. Uh, but we also realized that we had to take a strong, an interest and a responsibility for construction sequencing. Um, so uh, prefabrication was very important here. Uh, material handling, how to uh, get these 75-foot long blue lambs from the factory in upstate New York uh, to the site here in Connecticut um, so that we could drop them in um, uh, from, with a huge boom crane uh, and that then the folks who built the bridge could actually use the bridge as their staging deck and they could stay out of the wetland too. So I guess the conclusion of this project um, as a lesson for us was really that um, Project sequencing is a part of the design, um, and we think that the, the project kind of uh, ex expresses in a way um, that, that, uh, that early 
construction techniques. Um, another project right here in New Haven um, for a wonderful client who had a, a visionary idea about rescuing this, this, um, this kind of ur urban artifact, very beautiful from the early 19th century, um, and charged us with actually uh, fitting a lot of uses into a very tight shell. So it's a recording studio, it's a performance space um, with all of the uh, kind of technical infrastructure that, that those uses demand. Um, it's also a, pu a public space for gathering and a bar downstairs. Uh, there's an office at the back um, uh, on the top right for managing the, the business. And then there's a two uh, bedroom house inside. Um, so it was a, whoops, it was really a, um, a project about a kind of a Rubik's Cube um, challenge about fitting all of these uses into this existing shell. And the idea of shells um, of, as, a, as a light delivery system there in the middle of the section, kind of bringing light deep into the middle of the building because it was landlocked on east and west only with uh, uh, south light and north light. Um, so the idea about shells became a kind of organizing feature of the project. So um, an idea that um, they could give identity to the, to the building, that they would organize space, uh, that they would deliver light and give character and scale, and understanding that uh, all the elements in this, little, in this tight little project um, had to do double duty with, such as the um, concrete uh, uh, buttress that we introduced when we removed the carriage floor um, to bring light down into the, into the space below, um, and buttresses that we also, that are used to make space. Um, but that this shell, which really is tunable, and Alan will talk about that in a moment, um, a high, is a highly formed sculpted um, actually instrument itself whose origin is manipulating sound. Uh, and we were worried in a way that um, there was, the building was so tightly packed that there wasn't really any breathing room. Um, we did uncover the beautiful architectural elements um, of its construction in the spaces upstairs and, and we gained some height there. Um, but we, we wondered whether the spaces were too tight to be comfortable. And, and I think in a way what this project taught us was that actually it's the spaces between these elements um, that really kind of became charged for us, um, that these joints were really where the space was happening. So um, uh, that taught us a lot about kind of tightness of planning and architectural opportunity. So there it is, um, contributing wonderfully to the neighborhood, to our neighborhood. Um, another uh, story about a building um, that really is about the relationship of a very special community to its values um, and how those values might play out uh, in the expression of a building. Um, here at Fairfield University, um, there is this beautiful stand of American beech trees that actually have been kind of ignored and forgotten by the university um, and on the edge of the second growth forest and this became our site in the middle of the, of the school. Um, and this is a move across Jesuit institutions across the country to, to, to move out of the large dormitory buildings uh, that has um, what were large numbers of men um, and now into smaller buildings to accommodate a dwindling order. But it's an opportunity, um, it was at Fairfield and has been in other places, for this group to express their, um, their commitment to simplicity um, uh, and living lightly on the land. Um, so our initial kind of diagram of the steep site, we're steep, always to get very steep sites, hardly ever get flat ones, um, which is a lot of times a great opportunity, but always complex. Um, uh, you know, so our, our diagram became a kind of um, merging between the outreach to the public, which is an important part of their apostolic miss, mission, um, spaces for public gathering kind of in the middle, stepping down the section, um, and then uh, how, uh, simple rooms for the men looking out across those beech trees. Um, so it seemed like a pretty straightforward uh, proposition and also the group came to us um, with what looked like an extremely uh, straightforward program, very organized, they knew themselves well, they knew what they needed, they knew what the, how everything needed to touch, so we went to work. And I guess I should also say that we, we seem always to get um, new building types, you know, we're never quite qualified for them, but um, uh, we, we, we do our best. And so we, we, um, we took all these elements and we created this diagram, which I think wouldn't be called a great diagram here in the school, but it was the guiding diagram for us and it you know, had an organizing principle at the overlap of all of these elements. Um, and then we sort of arranged those elements on the plan, so the administrative wing on the top, a kind of a pinwheel plan for the public spaces in the middle, 
um, where the men invite sometimes their guests there and are often in community with each other. And then the, the very, uh, the serial just kind of um, simple rooms along the bottom of the page. Um, and the building is extremely simple in its, um, in its material expression. Uh, its main job is to um, uh, be in relationship to the beech trees, uh, which we um, uh, cleared out secondary floor from and exposed. There's a beautiful asset on the site cantilevered the, the living room out to stay away from the roots of the trees. Um, and the large porch, which faces east to the, to the university as part of their mission of kind of being open and a door always um, open to the community and to the students. And then the beacon, um, which when, when lit really shows where the chapel is, so bringing daylight down into that chapel um, as it faces east. And this large sort of front door to the campus um, and the cantilevered living room out over this gauging and basket system, which again seemed simple, uh, took actually some fighting on the part of the men. There was an interesting kind of story about the relationship of multi-headed client between this, this group of very thoughtful intellectual men in the university, which I think was a little bit worried about the simplicity actually of the building. And um, we probably, we never would have been able to accomplish something quite so abstract and even austere without the full commitment of, of this group of men. So. Um, you know, it was a it was a pretty cost-effective building. It's not a fancy construction type, but we took some steps uh, to bring daylight in, in in careful ways. This is the cowl um, here in the section, uh, so that we never would have glare coming directly into the chapel. And then the um, windows were sort of lit from the, the top and the sides all, at all times of the day. Um, and then, of course, just the simple the simple move of uh, offsetting the apertures in the chapel wall so that um, religious objects um, would, would be washed with daylight, um, but there would be no view to the outside, which is appropriate for a space of devotion. Um, and the sort of simple, repetitive uh, men's rooms, which they actually tell us they feel like they're in tree houses, which makes us happy. Um, and again, just a, uh, the relationship of the simple glue onto the um, brick gabion, the recycled brick gabion walls. Um, and really, that's the palette of, 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 of the building. Um, and there it is, uh, kind of talking to its, its beech trees. Um, and I think you know this concept of austerity was was something that was that they that they wanted us to express. And so our our main uh, kind of learning experience from this building was understanding how these Jesuitical vows of poverty and simplicity and living lightly on the land could really inform. Um, an institutional identity and how that could play out in, in architecture, um, which is a concept we found very powerful and actually a great privilege to work on. Um, so just um, a couple of words about some uh, residential projects. Um, here is uh, a little concept sketch for a tiny cottage um, for a couple who uh, contacted us and had a, a really large house and they were really looking for a much more compact simple space. Um, so you can see the, the site plan with their, you know, sort of 8,000 square foot house with two people and then down on the right um, uh, where once the 19th century bunkhouse had stood, which we thought we could save, couldn't be saved. So it became clear that we were going to be building a new house to accommodate them. It wasn't entirely clear what they were going to use the building for, maybe a caregiver, maybe a study. Um, uh, but the b bigger idea was that it would be a place of quiet and simplicity for them. And here's um, one of the clients, a wonderful um, man who's an archivist uh, and historian here at Yale in, in the neatest version of his study. Um, so uh, this um, translated into an idea of giving them in a way, uh, you know, a place away from, from their home. And so there they are sitting out on their deck um, with the building opened up. And so this, this also became a kind of a study in how small can a building be on a site? You know, how can it edge a site and kind of step away and let the site really be what's present? Um, and uh, the, how, what's the smallest move we can make to kind of get the head height that we need? We were very limited on the, build, on the zoning envelope here. Um, so here's a sort of peekaboo window in, in the sedum roof. Uh, but then how big can the building feel inside? So, so how, how much dimension do you actually need? And then what elements are present other than dimension in terms of, of making space? Um, so the, the project really for us was a kind of exercise in trying to crack a building open 
you know, to try to sort of open it at the seam so that it would bleed out into the landscape and light would bleed into it. Um, and it's a series of uh, um, investigations into different utilitarian qualities as needed for stairs and what was the lightest way that we could kind of handle them. How could we hide the kind of warts of the space um, so that it would answer their, their wish to be in a space um, of, of uh, kind of simplicity and contemplation, um, uh, a, a play of kind of inside and outside, the relationship between the operable windows and, and the flat ones, um, that kind of interest that we have in, in kind of surface versus depth. Um, and we found, we didn't expect this, but it was wonderful the way the building reflected its surroundings when it was finished. Um, and just a, a brief word about clients. They're very important. Um, and here they are. Um, uh, and they, they actually, I think what they ended up doing is spending pretty much all their time in this building, sort of never in the 8,000 square foot house uh, next door, which was, of course, they felt was a, a wonderful compliment. Um, and then another client um, uh, with a different set of goals, and this is a project we were working on at around the same time that the cottage, cottage was finishing. And when we proposed to um, our client, Simon Doonan, who creative director Barney Dunn hilariously describes himself as a simple window dresser. Um, and uh, you know, we, he, we showed him concepts that, that we'd used at the Kellys about a very simple interior with just light and, uh, and uh, bleached bamboo. And he said he would sooner slit his wrists than live in an all blonde <laughs> interior. <laughs> so we realized that we had to get to work in a different direction. And so um, I show you this really because these two projects were taking place concurrently. And, and in, this, um, in this project, our work, we really regarded our work as a kind of backdrop for the exuberance of uh, their lives and their collections and their sort of you know, fabulous clutter. Um, and uh, um, here, here's um, Simon's husband, Jonathan, you know, who, who really, um, they, they sort of took a quiet corner of the world and filled it up. The Kellys wanted to quiet, help us to help them make a very quiet corner. You know, but so it's this kind of intersection with the clients that's very important and becomes a real basis for the way that we proceed with our work. Um, uh, and I think that, that that question about where our interests meet, where their goals meet, you know, how, how use and expression comes out of that intersection is, is of real interest. Um, so I'll just close this section of our talk with a, a quote from another designer, Charles Ames, who said, um, Choose your corner. Pick away at it carefully, intensely, and to the best of your ability. And that way, you might change the world. More like this is the handoff. Pa painted us into a <laughs> corner. Uh, we painted ourselves into a corner, maybe rather than picking one. Um, it, it's maybe uh, a mistake to understand our inclusion of this slide as any. Uh, anything more than aspiration, you know, the idea that a couple could work together on a project um, uh, or, or be pinned to the sidewalk by their own creations in the case of this architecture magazine photograph. Um, I think what's uh, really incredible about Eames, um, which is that uh, he combined, or both of them combined, Charles and Ray combined picking a corner and a worldly view, um, is that sort of quality of saying, you know, we're industrial designers, but we take on enormous subjects. And when I look at that work, and I think about the relationship of material to the body, um, and then I think about those ideas being translated up in scale through industrial design and design experimentation um, to incredible sculptures that are actually industrial uh, processes to produce things that are outside of, of, of uh, typical architectural experimentation, airplanes and boat hulls. Um, I think that you know, there's an important notion about how you limit your approach in work. And I'm going to uh, pick up another quote from the Eames, which are an incredibly important uh, discussion of the, the relationship between scarce means and alternative uses. Many of you have heard this. You know, Eames was asked whether the design process could admit constraints. And he said design depends largely on constraints. And when pushed a little further, he said the sum of all constraints. Here's one of the few effective keys 
to the design problem, the ability of the designer to recognize as many of the constraints as possible, his willingness and enthusiasm for working within these constraints, constraints of price, of size, of strength, of balance, of surface, of time, and so forth. Each problem has its own peculiar list. Does design obey laws, his questioner asked. Aren't constraints enough, Ian replied. When I look at these veneers laid out in the process, getting ready for a glue lamination and form vacuum forming, I don't really think of them as material, uh, material in the sense of stuff, matter. I think of them, at least for the Eames, and perhaps as an inspiration to us as material in terms of subject matter. And so I'd like to talk a little bit, after Lisa having kind of laid out some provisional conclusions, some uses in Lionel Robbins' terms, um, I'd like to talk about approaches. And I also want to take on Khan's suggestion that our work is crafted. I wish our work was craftsmanship. Um, there are a lot of questions about craft and the relationship of architects and craft. I don't, I don't actually think architects craft anything. Um, I think they enable craft. Uh, I think if they do, are making, are, are crafting things, are building buildings themselves, as we've seen, uh, we risk a kind of uh, uh, conceptual paucity, I think. I think doing, taking on too much sometimes uh, uh, produces a, a, a lack of conceptual clarity. And that's something we're trying to correct and to work on. So I'll talk a little bit about crafts in my conclusion. Um, I know that time is a little short, uh, and I want to make sure that I cover some of the projects that are upcoming. But I want to arrange them in terms of some approaches. I, I guess I would say means, um, scarce means perhaps, based on some engineering principles that we like. I won't talk all about all of them, Bob, don't worry. Um, but I, but I want to focus on issues that are, are in a sense, the observe, observe of, sorry, the, 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 the obverse of, of craft. Uh, ideas like laxity, allowance, tolerance, mitigation, slop, clearance, all of these things that any craftsman uh, would try to avoid in a search for pre precision, but that architects and I think manufacturers and industry try to game and take advantage of. Um, I'll focus on one of my favorites, um, failure, uh, a concept with which anyone who's tried to run a small practice is uh, deeply familiar. Um, failure, of course, has serious implications for architects and builders. Um, I read from the uh, rule number 229 from the Code of Hammurabi from 2250 BC. If a builder builds a house for anyone and does not complete it firmly, and the house that he has built collapses and kills the owner, then the builder shall be put to death. We've had plenty of experiences with failure, um, too many to enumerate here. But with experience, um, I guess you can learn from failure. And I want to talk about one particular project uh, that we seem as a failure of, of our own um, and maybe a larger failure. Uh, this is the New Haven Coliseum. Some of you <coughs> who've come here recently don't remember looking down Orange Street to the, to the south and this hulking monstrosity. Uh, and I say that in the fondest terms. Uh, 60 feet above the street level, four levels of parking that could empty out 2,400 cars in 20 minutes, an amazing feat of technology, um, maybe the architect's version of craft, I'm not sure. Um, and we never really liked this building. It kind of shaded our neighborhood. It felt decrepit and in bad shape until it was announced that it was going to be torn down, at which point we immediately decided that it was our favorite building in New Haven, if not the world. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and also uh, noted that Rem Kohlhaus, uh, Alan Plattis once told me when he came to New Haven, announced that the New Haven Coliseum, probably in better shape at the time, uh, was his favorite building, no surprise. Um, so I felt like I was in pretty decent company in, in feeling this way. Um, so, you know, roused by the support of a, like five AHL hockey fanatics who enjoyed seeing the building uh, and, and, and a couple of wayward, a sort of wayward posse of New Haven new urbanists uh, who were caught in this really awkward position of, uh, of advocating this, the salvation of the historic city but not really understanding exactly what the terms of the historic city were in this particular location. Um, we made a proposal to suffuse the building with program, to take it over with all kinds of theaters and, and, and exhibition spaces and commercial retail space and, and a, a new museum uh, uh, for, for uh, the city of New Haven, um, restaurants on the amazing upper level, 90 feet above the, of the city, looking across Long Island Sound. Um, recreation centers, all kinds of things. 
And, and then that this, this sort of infusion of life and program would leak itself out into the, into the city and uh, it would uh, attract uh, institutions like the Long Wharf Repertory Theater um, and it would, it would change the life of this, at that time, very decrepit neighborhood. Um, we presented this to the city and uh, we received a, a very clear response on the, <laughs> on, on the part of uh, Mayor DiStefano. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we thought we'd take it to the people. So we made a big public presentation of our work and there were a lot of drawings and we got a bunch of students and colleagues to work on it together and we, we presented it. And, and, uh, and then in a sort of final act of defiance, we put it in our storefront uh, at our office downtown and we received this rousing response, which <laughs> was <laughs> strangely inscribed in, in pink lavender nail polish, which by the way is really hard to get off glass. Uh, um, but you know, listen, when, when, the, 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 when, when, the, when government and the citizenry are united in a position, there's really, there's really not a lot to go with, even if you think your ideas are really strong. Um, and so, so we want as this edifice, uh, this kind of enormous body of embodied material and energy and public finance and um, uh, carbon emissions and all these kinds of things <laughs> were, were we're, we're spreading across our city and leaving in its wake. Um, oh, I like this. This is sort of partially demolished. This is a kind of moment uh, in history right here. Uh, uh, leaving in its wake uh, what we now know to be the uh, parking lot along the Oak Street connector. This is only, by the way, one level of parking, not four. Uh, so we've lost a few things. We've gained a lot of the heat island effect um, um, and perhaps a promise uh, under this, the guise of uh, Herb Newman and a few other people who will be here tonight, I hope, in the audience, um, a better solution than a part surface parking lot. Um, so failure had a lot to tell us um, and, and uh, reminded us that when we make buildings, we, we've taken on a lot of things, and when we take them away, we've lost them. Uh, uh, I think we can be a little more inventive than that, uh, particularly because the thing that we have to remember is that the, the resources that we draw upon to make our buildings come from a deeper, um, and more invasive layer of the Earth's surface uh, with huge impacts and costs in terms of energy. And they're all fully subsidized and hidden from us. I think this goes to Lisa's point about architecture speaking with a corpse in his mouth, borrowed, of course, from John Whiteman. This is an academic institution. I have to be careful about uh, attribution. Um, and, and, and to consider not only uh, where these materials come from, but what we see when we make buildings and we understand that uh, beyond the limits of the site, are uh, en enormous uh, effects. And if you take on the energy systems that go into the making of buildings, even the small ones, um, and, and their potential impacts, you know that the work of the architect has to expand profoundly. Uh, defect, uh, another concept I'd like to address. Um, defectiveness is an unacceptable flaw. It, uh, it's in products. Uh, and of course, I think we're in the business of making products. And it's a reason for disposal, which we have a lot of waste, and it's also an excuse for litigation, which is kind of interesting, and therefore worth considering, I think, as a worthy subject of design um, and in a culture of resource depletion. And, and who, better, who better to experiment um, with this concept of de defect um, than a group of men committed to forgiveness, poverty, and spiritual pedagogy, uh, our friends at the Jesuit Center. Um, these trees were pretty damaged. Um, one was destroyed entirely uh, and had to be cut down. The university had stockpiled soil on top of a 65-inch diameter beech tree and killed it. Um, and they were about to chip it up in a chipper and spread it as mulch. Um, and we decided instead that we'd argue the, the benefits of transfiguration to a Jesuit community. Uh, you, can, you can imagine their uh, uh, surprise at hearing us talk about that. Um, and talk about all the sort of flaws that could be then turned in through the understanding of the problems of beach as a species, uh, the, 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 the tendencies of cupping and checking and splitting and all the things that are recognized as flaws that are unsellable um, on the market, on the lumber market, and to take these pieces and to produce some architecture uh, knowing that these systems would start to break down and, and, and sort of display their, their flaws and their defects. Um, so we produced a kind of a rood screen between the great room in the chapel out of beach, which has now gone from being about a th flat three quarter inch surface uh, to being about three inches deep with all its warping. Um, and we took a large, particularly large tree, the butt <coughs> of this tree that was standing dead, 
and we worked it and carved it and went through all the sort of stereotomic uh, processes to produce uh, a flawed but we think um, interesting altar filled with a lot of character. It's certainly a lot of physical movement um, which will take place and change the character of the altar over the next few years. Um, and we were lucky uh, that the, these Jesuit men bought our premise about failure. I think another uh, important engineering concept is laxity. And it reflects a kind of an approach, maybe even to this lecture. Uh, I should be a little more careful. Um, but, but also a kind of important technical concept in the control of sound, uh, which we explored um, by uh, trying to damage or flex or destroy plywood, uh, actually, which is designed in its cross lamination to produce stiffness, I think, as everyone knows. Um, and so we went to work on it uh, to, to produce these tunable shells for the acoustical spaces of the firehouse, which Lisa showed. Um, I, I'm showing the sort of seamy underside. The idea that, that this warped surface would produce the proper acoustical character in a room designed both for performance and for recording in which acoustical kind of character is not uh, of value. You want an acoustically dead space. And so we built this sort of instrument, tested it first, modeled it uh, acoustically with a Swiss uh, acoustic engineer who decided it was too complex for him to figure out, um, and, and, and then uh, went into this uh, room and built it. Uh, and then we actually did tune it with our client checking the acoustics, a recording uh, expert himself. Um, and uh, then we carved apart the screen at the back of the proscenium stage to produce diffusion testing certain details to prevent the uh, continued splitting of a curve cut in plywood. Um, and then. Uh, eventually produce something that might have been, in another case, acoustical foam or uh, a felt um, was now the plywood working as a sound refractor. Um, so that, that idea of uh, laxity uh, kind of translates also in an interest in instability. And I want to describe quickly this competition for a, a, a public promenade, a sort of porch, as they call it, in Stamford, Connecticut on the remediation project of the Mill River that explored not the bending capacity of wood, but the elastic, be elastic bend bending capacity of wood, its ability to return to shape and therefore produce changing shape through the life of the, of the, uh, the building. The building is really treated in our uh, project as a kind of fabric net, um, one that is draped, it's hung, it's actually not supported. Um, and we tested in a, a variety of ways using structural engineering analysis programs, um, but also just good old plain old elbow grease. Um, a lot of different tests at different scales, and then we applied it to the site. We had won a competition uh, after a sort of drunken night at a Christmas holiday party um, and realized that the deadline was the following day, and so we uh, decided uh, to make this screen and, and then spent the next three years trying to figure out actually how to do it. Um, the, the site is the remediation, as I said, of a channelized riverbed that runs through the center of Stanford. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers has already done its work. Uh, the Olin Partnership has uh, replaced the riparian wetland. Uh, and the cherry trees that once lined the bank, the beloved cherry trees that once lined the bank, this is now the newly remediated site. Um, and this is our site plan. It's very simple. It's a kind of lattice that runs about 500 feet along the floodplain uh, where we were allowed to work. Um, just to note, the building up above it, which I won't talk about because of time, is a carousel pavilion, which turned into another project over the three years that we struggled with solving the architecture of the canopy. Um, and we tried a lot of, as I said, a lot of different techniques, um, looked at different possibilities, and now have a set of working drawings that are, is really a, a grid shell, which is numerically determined simply by the relationship of the pins that um, join um, the, the, each layer of the structure. At, at their intersections. Misappropriation has been a really valuable uh, theme for us. Um, I say it in the fondest terms. Uh, misappropriation is the misunderstanding and the misapplication of an idea. Um, we were really tantalized by this particular uh, sand barn in northern Ontario. Um, not the bar building itself, a three-point arch is a pretty typical structure, but the, the, the panel lying on the ground uh, seemed to be a great inspiration. It was pure formalism. We looked at the shape, we liked it, we liked the feel of it, and we applied it to it, actually a bridge that we, were, we needed to build for a construction crossing in Washington, Connecticut. The bridge is uh, it's really a, a kind of simple application of an idea, the maximum 
a, a capacity of a glue laminator's presses um, applied in six panels over a 75-foot span. And as Alicia showed you, that translated into a new, a new misappropriation of an idea, the footbridge that we built um, over the, the floodplain and the ravine in Madison, Connecticut at the Green Hill Brook uh, Conservancy. And that's finally evolved into another bridge. Um, now we're borrowing shape as well as, uh, uh, as, well as material um, to, to introduce a, a kind of clear span uh, of suspension bridge across a uh, 140 foot wide riverbed, which we're not allowed to touch because of the DEP regulations of this particular important body of water. Um, and we developed, as Lisa described, the sort of suspension systems where we're actually construction managing this bridge. And it's about to go to construction after a fractious four years of uh, not the, the DEP and the Inland Wetland Commission was fine. It was the client, uh, the client group that were arguing among themselves. And we're about to start construction actually in about a week. Now, why I call that misappropriation is because glue lamps work really well. They're, of course, laid up horizontally, and they work really well um, um, in the vertical uh, axis when um, the layers actually can be separated and graded so that the best layers are at the tension and compression edges of the beam. But by turning it on its side, we'd actually eliminated the benefit of engineered lumber. Uh, so it was a kind of folly in a sense. But we learned from our mistakes and finally righted ourselves. This is a house, a first test of this idea. Um, to solve a problem for this uh, uh, project that Bob mentioned, the, the Joey Verdino Memorial Grandstand, named in honor of a, a, a little kid who passed away, whose father gathered the enormous catchment of Staten Island, which serves the South Shore Little League at the southwest corner of Manhattan, uh, of Staten Island, I'm sorry. No, no, big mistake there. Um, my Staten <laughs> Island friends would challenge me. Um, and this particular site, as I said, in a floodplain, um, uh, Staten Island suffered mightily at the last, in the last hurricane, as you all know. Um, and the development of, of, uh, of a new grandstand. Um, this is what they're dealing with right now. Um, but it is amazing when the, the death of a child uh, becomes a kind of motivation. Uh, a whole community came out and, and funded not only the, the project, but the, the, the sort of research that went into it. And it was been an amazing experience. Um, so again, really just the study of how fixed laminations can be, how to produce shape using a really simple application to replace steel, which is a sort of standard um, idea. Um, uh, a way to lift the crowd, uh, the parents from uh, above and away from their children. If, you, if, you've ever, if you've actually ever been to a, say, like an East Haven uh, might hockey practice, you know what I'm talking about. You know, like little kids get a little bothered, and I think the, the fathers of the South Shore Little League, um, and mothers too, I'm sorry, um, should uh, realize that they, they wanted to keep the, the, the dads and uh, Dads are at the loudest ones, uh, away from their kids, so elevated them up. So what we produce is, as they describe the experience of the show for the kids um, and, and for the, the parents, uh, another kind of show, which is that they get to be removed from their kids and hopefully behave themselves. Um, and so the Joey uh, A. Verdino Jr. Grandstand is about to break ground, despite the DDC's resistance to the idea of using mass timber, even in this most obviously simple application um, uh, for their project. Upcycling uh, is an important concept. We all know we're all environmentally conscious here, right? Um, um, our, we're upcycling the idea of timber uh, to a whole new level, I think, and we're really excited about it, at least for the United States. Um, students for the Common Ground High School know a lot about um, taking waste material and applying it to um, growth. And, and this is, uh, these are red worms and compost that they use to grow gardens. Um, these are any inner city kids at a charter school in New Haven who are learning about agriculture and the environment. And we were charged by our clients to explore the idea of material and the sort of pedagogy of environmentalism. I show this slide because, uh, just to hearken a little back to our time at Yale, uh, about the time we were at, in school in the late 80s, we had a lot of teachers who were interested in the sort of phenomenological project uh, of, of architecture. Um, and you know there was a lot of, this is Johanny uh, comparison comparison of of Alvaralto's uh, glued up uh, joint, furniture joint, and, and a tree, calling it the man-made tree. Um, when, when we looked at that, that Alto project, we weren't actually focusing on the romantic Karelian history of, of Finland. Uh, we were interested in glue and sticks and, and, and how could we make really cool stuff and shapes. And Alto was an experimenter. And, and, and Alto wasn't a craftsman. Uh, you know, as our friend Richard Croker from Dalhousie University, a couple of years ago when we were touring Alto's house, which he built and which our students will get to see in a couple of weeks. Um, 
he described uh, Alto's details as a dog's breakfast, uh, which is a, a, a kind of quaint Canadianism, I think, and I apologize to Canadians in the audience. And to dogs. And, and to dogs, <laughs> right. Um, you know, Alto, who, Alto, who was a master, a master of making, you know, really evocative, build, humane buildings, in some ways, like Ames, uh, uh, but, but, but not, not, not in the same way, of course. Um, uh, he had trouble being a craftsman himself. Um, so I, I, I just want to focus a little on glue and wood for a minute and, and just run through this sort of series. Uh, this is a big glue lamp. Uh, you can make an amazing uh, project products now, um, and they're being made, and they're being tested all over Europe and, and just starting in Canada and, and maybe, maybe in our studio um, and with the new USDA tall wood uh, competition that's going to be announced <coughs> in about a week, and you guys should all enter. I can't. I'm actually a juror, hint, hint. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, we'll start to see amazing projects being done. But for now, what we're focusing on is the application of timber, cellulose insulation, CLT panels, um, even so, sort of some familiar systems to a school uh, for kids, a couple of classrooms uh, up on, the, on West Rock um, and uh, that use cross-laminated timber, one of the first applications in the United States coming from um, Quebec, um, combined with different cellulose insula insulation systems uh, to produce this performative roof made of mass timber that serves both as structure and as finish um, and also operates performatively to bring in daylight, of course, and to insulate and to, to uh, produce uh, 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 energy and, and also to serve as a sort of catchment for water, much like the land around it. And all of these lessons are part of a pedagogical project to make a new school um, for the students, uh, which will hopefully break ground. Um, we're supposed to break ground in the spring and we're wrestling with the Bureau of School Facilities and all kinds of things. Um, but the main, main lesson is that just passively putting almost 400 metric tons of carbon embedded, sequestered in that wall system and in that roof system means that our, our cars that will be parking there can, can travel carbon free for about a year, which is really interesting. And if you actually translate that out to the larger problem of the American landscape, suburban sprawl, um, and the way we tend to build and you, you project that through um, the potential power of American forests, um, obviously not of the stature of these. We're not cutting that stuff. We're, we're proposing to cut the little stuff. Um, and, and, and that vast resource that is a kind of carbon sink um, in and of itself. Um, and, and the ability of American workers to build lots of housing, albeit in a kind of low rise application, um, which consumes land at, uh, at an alarming rate. And you redeploy all of that material that's sequestered across a vast area of landscape. And you, you work back through the details of the, the house and the way that the students in the first year study framing and very banal sort of seeming things. And you understand it quantitatively. And then you redeploy it in a new high density application. And you look at the way that instead of using little thin sheets and little sticks, we can start to use massive pieces of wood to produce whole new sources of engineering and systems and, and produce a new type of urbanization just based not on great design, I'm not suggesting that, but on just simple typologies of structure. And then I think that idea of system boundaries, which is pretty typical to science, scientific inquiry, but is obviously maybe a little less understood in architectural practice, is something that we might start to deploy. Um, and so I'm going to end uh, with one final uh, uh, sequence. And I just uh, will start by saying that Kahn's material handling method, his little, his workers at DACA carrying cement and sand in boxes, um, casting uh, concrete by hand um, to produce uh, buildings of an enormous scale, um, but recognizing that, that the the capacity of the workforce could only produce about a five foot pour before a cold joint had to be introduced into these very tall walls. And therefore, um, at the recommendation of his engineer, Auguste Commandant, decided that um, he, he would add a marble sill to cover the cold joint. And that would produce the, the language of the architecture, one of the, one of the most sort of important material aspects of, this, of the building. Um, and so I want to talk about craft before I end here, uh, again, this is the Jikoku Kusabi joint, literally the hell joint. It's, it's, a, it's known in the uh, Western Hemisphere as the fox-tailed blind wedge tenon. It's a mouthful. Um, I can almost handle the Japanese better. Uh, 
And it, it's a sort of piece of craft daring do. You know, no one really knows that when that mortise is driven into the, uh, when that tenon is driven into the mortise, the hole, and those wedges hit the back of the mortise, that it expands the tenon and locks the joint. And so if your measurements are off at all, you fail, and the joint can only be destroyed. It can't be used. Um, it can't be fixed. Um, but if you succeed and you make a tight joint that's incredibly stiff moment connection, um, you've produced craft. You've, you've succeeded in this sort of tying the knot of material and procedure, the, uh, you know, sort of the, a, a glue that binds panache and procedure. Um, and I, I think that's really interesting, but it's hidden. It's a sort of hermetic project. And um, the risk of, of craft, which is typically considered something that's artful as well as uh, technical, um, is that if you go too far with it and you start to get a little bit too much into the exhibition of craft, it, craft devolves, it devolves into sort of trickery and cunning and deceitfulness. And, and, and trickery and cunning maybe are, 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 are just on economic terms more than we can, can, can take at a, at a moment right now, especially when costs uh, in the broadest sense are, are the subject. And so I guess I, I would suggest that rather than crafting things, what we are in the process of doing is trying to game industry. Um, because we don't have time for craft and we're not really good craftsmen. So what we're doing is taking sort of off the shelf parts and pieces at a time when the American building industry, as John Patkow said a couple of years ago, is not engaged in the process of building. They're engaged in the process of, process of specifying products and buying them um, and, and amalgamating them in building form. Uh, and, and, and that's a, a sort of depressing thought. And so what we do when we're depressed is we go shopping. Um, we learned that from George Bush. Um, and particularly catalog <laughs> shopping, this, this McMaster car catalog is right next to our, my copy of Derrida and the American Vitruvius, <laughs> I swear it. Um, and, and so I guess I'd like to look at one last building very quickly, a, a building that Lisa and I finished a few years ago. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a repair job, and I want to quote uh, Susan Strasser, who, who wrote, um, uh, uh, picked up, found this wonderful little uh, thing from the 1896 Manual of Mending and Repairing. Manufacturers all work by machinery, and not so to speak, by hand. But all repairing must be done by hand. We can make every detail of a watch or a gun by machinery, but the machine cannot mend it when broken, much less a clock or a pistol. I guess in the end, I think we may seem unambitious here at Yale, which is a source of enormous inspiration and, and, a, and a producer of great ambitions. Uh, uh, that, that our project may not seem as an ambitious, as an ambitious undertaking. Uh, but we understand ourselves, I think, to be in the business of repair. And that the, the processes that go into the making of a building, even a simple shell um, that uses standard lumber racking, exterior lumber racking as a sort of system of ordering uh, materials spread across the site, um, simple frames of steel, uh, an off-the-shelf uh, pre-made space frame, uh, assembled quickly on site uh, to incorporate the shelving, a polycarbonate sheath for an interior lining of the building um, that brings a little daylight in. Uh, again, all these, all these kinds of components that are very, very simple to assemble um, and to find in a McMaster car catalog, uh, they represent some, I think, a, a way for us to untie the tight configurations of industry in America, the building industry, and to test some opportunities uh, um, for, for making architecture from extremely simple and even scarce means. So I'll end this uh, tonight. Um, uh, our, a student of ours, a student of ours, Brooke Dennison, who ended up teaching here, when he saw this building said, God, it's like the love affair between a, a tractor and its shed. And, <laughs> and, and when I looked at that little animation, I thought, God, it's more like the beginning of Masters of Sex. You know, <laughs> there, there's something kind of creepy about it. So I, I guess I will, I'll shift to this uh, vision. I have to say, because I think I'm a little bit of a, a, a Neanderthal when it comes to envisioning architecture, that uh, I didn't really know that this building, I knew that it would emit light, but I didn't think about it emitting light from the outside. And, and, and when Yale graduate who worked with us for a while, Bo Crockett, took this photograph, I was kind of surprised. Um, so. I think that's the end of our talk. I guess what I'd say is that um, you know, we're, we're, we're on our way trying to repair some things, our own damage sometimes. I'm, I'm certainly uh, damaged, a damaged planet in many ways, the ones that we all have to work on. 
Um, and we proceed uh, pretty simply, non-ideologically, improvisationally, opportunistically, definitely. Uh, fixing our mistakes when they happen, adjusting, if not necessarily improving our techniques. Um, and I guess I'd say on the lookout for a little romance when we can find it. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, I think we're seeing that shift as we move up in scale. And uh, frankly, the jury's out, you know, whether <laughs> we, we have five buildings in full CDs having been bid waiting to start. And we're just trying to push, and these are all 20, 30,000 square foot buildings waiting to happen, most built in timber. Um, whether they do or not, I, I think they will, but I think it's an open question, as it is in Finland. Some other questions, please? Way back, there's a question. We can get the mic up there. Can't see. Yeah, thank you guys for a really wonderful lecture. It's beautiful work. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the process by which you arrive. Um, that's something I think as students were, were constantly sort of grappling with. And I'm wondering, you showed a lot of details and a lot of interest in kind of uh, the conglomeration of, of different tectonic things and materiality. I'm wondering, is, is that sort of an a priori thing where you're, you're coming to the process saying we want to use wood we want to use glue lamps, or, or do you work in a way that's more, it starts to arise out of the conditions? Maybe that's too broad of a question, but I'm, yeah, I guess I'm wondering, are these things you're always bringing with you, or are you working out to them? I, I don't think it's a priori at all, actually. I mean, I think, I think our process, which is incredibly involved and interactive, of course, um, you know, starts with kind of all the information on the table, so, you know, Site and program and client and, and 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 goals and all of that, and then we you know we, we do sort of try to work toward a solution. I, I guess I would also say that you know with wood, you know really we what I realized is that we started as a design build office. We didn't we were not aware of it at the time, but but that what that meant is we were designing stuff and then was no one else was going to build it, so we built it instead. Sometimes and, the expensive ideas. Well, that's right. <laughs> but um, so and the and the sort of most direct way to, to go at that, you know, when we were starting out was 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 building in wood and, um, you know, I think Alan had a particular facility and interest and background also in in in, um, in construction and in, in um, furniture all kinds of wood design. But um, so, I mean, that, that sort of informed where we're coming from, but it's not an ideological position. I mean, it does feel like a great opportunity to us and one that's sort of like underutilized still, especially at large scales, sort of confined mostly to houses here. And um, that's why I think it feels like an exciting time for us to be on the kind of cusp of what, what may be a new building type in, in, in America. But it's not ideological. Yeah, I don't think it's a priori, but it's definitely a limitation. It's kind of like habit, I guess. Um, and that's something we will spend the next 23 years, if we make it to cons age, um, uh, testing and pushing. And, and uh, obviously, there are going to be amazing changes beyond what we're anticipating right. in construction. Um, you know, I think, I think we came from Yale, and Yale gave us a very formalist education, I think. Um, and I say that in the most positive sense. I think we had great teachers who taught us a lot about building experience and understanding daylight and all these things that are intangible. But I think they understood that the means that we use are physical, formal ones to build. And so we had to learn about, uh, from our, our range of teachers, basically how to, how to kind of get the thing into the ground and what its opportunities were once you take that step. Um, and so that's a bias, I think, that we bring to it. And I, 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 I think, uh, I guess I would say, I hope it's not a limitation. I hope it's not a priori or ideological. I hope it is something that um, allows us to experiment a little more freely, even at the small scale with the kind of limited means we have. Joel Sanders, wait, one, let's get to the mic down here. Uh, in, again, thank you for such a wonderful, wonderful lecture. I know how hard it is to stand up in front of your Pals. family <laughs> as, as you were. And, and you, you, in your introduction, you know, made that analogy between, let's say, architecture schools, our own education, and, and families. We have a complicated relationship to, uh, to them. They leave an indelible impression on us. And so I guess I was wondering if you could sort of reflect maybe a little bit about what you just ended with, about how your work both, you know, perhaps perpetuates the values that you learned, but also maybe even more importantly reacts against them uh, from your education. And then I just, I, and then at the very end, I was thinking of that question the entire time I was watching your, your talk, and then you made that sort of relationship to Masters of Sex, which is my new favorite obsession, I love that show. <laughs> and so I'm too, wondering, you know, the masters if, or the if, sex? Yes, you yes. have to watch it, you're going to love it. Um, 
but I was wondering is, let's say your um, romance, sh should be credit, blame your, your romance with, or maybe, dare I say, fetishization of te tectonics, construction, materiality to your experience at Yale? Yes. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't mean to over-dramatize uh, my background. I worked in construction, and I did it a fair amount and thought I would do it and then had a sort of middle-class crisis and thought I had to get a graduate degree. Um, and I'm really lucky that I did. At a weird time at Yale where there were a lot of different ideas and a lot of different people teaching. Um, but yes, Yale, the DNA of Yale, as Lisa's described it, I think is um, trying, to, uh, uh, trying to figure out how Building can be an intellectual exercise, but build it. Right. Um, and and I, I, we don't think that's the only way. It's just really what we know. So in a sense, what we do by starting a practice where we're actually moving things and trying to assemble them and hope that the ideas are good and that can support the inquiry, um, often they weren't, um, uh, is that, that we can get beyond those limitations and that through interacting with you all that we can start to hear ideas. That's one of the greatest things about teaching is that um, I realize how full of shit I am on a regular basis, hearing what other people are saying. Um, and I may be grumpy about it, but it, it changes my, it, it, it turns me, it turns the battleship, I think, a little bit. So how do you react to the benefit of this? Well, I guess I would say that in, in teaching here, I try to look, even though I've been charged with teaching the Yale Building Project and figuring out how to get ideas to building, I think, I hope, we try to bring in other ideas. Maybe we don't do it well enough, but I'm, I'm, I, I, like the, I like the conceptual bases, the kind of cultural issues that we face, the social and economic conditions from which we work to be a bigger part of that inquiry. I think it's really hard in first year, frankly. I think everyone's just trying to figure out what they're up to. But I'd like that to be the, the project. I'd like the building project to be the fourth year studio at Yale, honestly. Um, and this is a great moment. Well, I mean, I think, are you also asking um, how are we kind of pushing back against this predilection that people had when we were educated here to sort of be do-it-yourself and, you know, handmade? And it was a really weird time, actually. I happened to be here with, with three different deans and, you know. Um, uh, you did I, it in three years, though. I was here for only three years, you know, in graduate school, but there were three different deans. And, um, you know, I, uh, there was a, it was kind of like the tail end of postmodernism. It was so interesting to see Fats lecture, a brilliant lecture. Uh, last week and, and hear, you know, what the impact of postmodernism plus the recession, which affected all of us too, you know, had on their, the arc of their careers. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that we had a, a kind of real do-it-yourself mentality, and I guess I still feel as though we have that, and what I hope is that as our projects get larger and sort of more far-flung, far we, we have a little bit less imprint on them, you know, because I think it's actually uh, in a way more creative and there's a kind of intellectual challenge around kind of orchestrating from afar or even maybe not even orchestrating, you know, but understanding in a slightly more abstract way um, what the project is. So, you know, it's sort of a, I think our career is really, it, it, it feels like it, it, it emerged without us exactly steering <laughs> in some ways. I mean, um, but, but it's, the point of a, it feels like a ticker. Yeah, it's definitely a work in progress. It's a work in progress. <laughs> Okay, unless there's another question. I think we've had enough family confession. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you very, very, very much. And all of us join.